one that's headed the other day. <laughs> they do take care of me. Thank all of you for being here today, and I, I see so many of you who have been here previously to our programs, and I know that several of you are here because you uh, know our author and her family, so I'm sure that later on I hope you have an opportunity to welcome them all back. We do welcome you uh, and hope that you will enjoy this at lunch. We have an opportunity to really visit with Dr. Roth and with Mark, and uh, we just had a great time. We were having such a good time that we decided we would bring all of you all to lunch and we could just continue our conversation. <laughs> but we have, did have an excellent lunch, and we want to especially thank Stephanie and Dr. Roth for uh, coming back to us and sharing information about her writing and about the things that she um, came across as she was writing. And she certainly uh, is more than just a, a distant author to us. She's home folks. So thank you very much and thank all of you for being here. Thank you everyone for coming. I'm Jessica Perkins Smith. I'm the University Archivist here at Mississippi State. And I want to just um, thank Stephanie again for coming and tell you a little bit about how this um, program came to be and how Stephanie and I kind of got in touch. Um, a little over two years ago, I came to Mississippi State um, as an archivist. And um, I also went to Millsaps and was in the history department there. So I knew of Stephanie and she had come to the Millsaps History Department after I left. Um, and I knew some of, somewhat about her work that she had been working on a book on the Citizens Council. And the Citizens Council has always been one of my main areas of research and studying um, segregationists and mass resistance in Mississippi. So when I came to Mississippi State, I was um, really interested to find that we had a fair amount of material related to the Citizens Council and to the segregation in Mississippi um, and to civil rights as well. So I, um, but I had looked at some of our manuscript collections, and one day a patron came in and said, I see that you all have these um, Citizens Council radio forum tapes, and you have the transcriptions. I'd like to see X, Y, and Z transcriptions, and he starts telling me about it, and I said, I'm not, I'm not sure what you're talking about. So it took me a little bit, but I discovered that not only did we have these transcriptions of these forum tapes, but we had what I, what I'm pretty sure is the only complete run of the radio forum tapes. So there's about 418 tapes that run from 1957 to the mid-1960s. And what I discovered was that in Stephanie's graduate work here, she had transcribed almost all of the tapes and donated them to special collections. So this is how we um, came to have those transcriptions and those tapes. Um, and so shortly after I discovered the transcriptions and realized what a great resource we had here, a grant opportunity came up through CLEAR, the Council on Library and Information Resources, and the grant was for recordings at risk. Um, and there, these recordings, these tapes, um, many of them, some, some of them had already popped on the reel. Stephanie later told me when she was listening to them. And we knew they weren't going to last much longer, even in our um, even in our cold storage, even in our storage area. So I applied for the grant, and with Stephanie wrote a wonderful letter of support, and we were able to get the funding to digitize those tapes. Um, so it's just been it's going to be an amazing resource for researchers, and I think going to really expand um, opportunities for people looking at civil rights and at segregation in Mississippi and throughout the country because. People on these tapes are not just Mississippi politicians or Mississippi folks, but there are people that were very prominent nationally at the time. So um, if it weren't for Stephanie transcribing those tapes years ago in special collections um, before I got here, um, then we would not be here and have, have, um, have this resource that we can now uh, put on our website and have available to researchers um, all over the world. So I want to really thank her especially for that. And um, when we got in touch and she wrote the letter of support, this has all been about a year and a half ago, I knew her book was coming down the pipe. And I said, you know, we want to get you here when your book is published. Um, we'd love to bring you back to Mississippi 
stay welcome you and we're really all just so grateful and thankful that you're here um, so if y'all would welcome Dr. Stephanie Wall.
saw the other part of this, which is what most people believe to be true. And Neil's work is amazing in its scope. He writes in the midst of the council's existence. He also does much of his research in citizens' council offices in Jackson, so they let him in. And he goes through their archives and their paperwork um, and spends months and months and months with them. Um, later, they do a book review of his book, and they're not pleased, um, as you might imagine. But they do two separate book reviews in The Citizen, which is their monthly publication. And, you know, they really feel betrayed by him. That, you know, they, they were generous by letting him in the door. But their biggest complaint was that he wrote that book as if the council was defunct. And they were very offended by that because they were fully employed in this battle in the 1970s. So as I kind of got around some of these and learned a little bit more about this, I realized that the Citizens Council wasn't just a tenure organization. The broadcast, the forum broadcast itself, which you can see sort of an advertisement for it that showed up in, their, um, in the Citizens Council newspaper, their first pub regular publication. Um, forum ran until 1966. So this really intrigued me. Um, this was also around the time where historians were becoming really invested in figuring conservatism out, and a lot of the people that were showing up on the index were conservatives. And I started listening to these programs, and they started talking about conservatism. And I was really surprised that on forum, civil rights was not coming up very often. So this was one of the more shocking things to me. They did talk about civil rights legislation, but they were often referring to the federal government, or they were talking about white moderates, white liberals. They saw their battle in a lot of ways as a battle that was being fought with other white people. That if they could achieve white unity, then this would not be an issue. And so what my book does, I think, is it raises some new questions. Um, about this. And we were talking about it earlier earlier with um, a new friend of mine, Billy, um, and about, you know, he asked me, is this, you know, so do you feel like this is it? Like, is this the definitive work? And of course it isn't. I wish it was, because um, I've spent enough time on it. But of course, the historians in the room know that that's not really how we work, unfortunately. But I have sort of strived to write, I, I, I was striving to write the book in a way that it would raise all kinds of questions for scholars about the way that we think about the Citizens Council. Neil McMillan's work ran from 54 to 64, which is about the time that the Citizens Council was birthed, rose to power, and then kind of <coughs> fell off after the Civil Rights Act. That's kind of what his framework looks like. But the Council itself didn't officially disband until 1989. So what I tried to do in the book is I tried to sort of figure out, first, what were they doing after 64? But once I started getting a look at that, I had to kind of rewrite because there was something I wanted to track from the very beginning, and that was the alliances they were building with white organizations, with white minority regimes in Southern Africa, um, with the Pioneer Fund in New York, that they had built, by the time we get to 1964, the council had, was a vital part of a network that included conservatives, radical white um, people, as well as um, supporters and fighters of scientific racism. They had made international inroads into um, several countries, Europe and in Southern Africa. And so as I started back, at 1954, I kind of wanted to figure out how early did they start doing this. My sense at the very beginning was they started doing it after they lost the battle against the civil rights movement. I was surprised again to find that they had their eye on this the whole time. That they were building these alliances as early as 58 when they moved forum to Washington, D.C. for its weekly reporting. So, this is, you know, as I kind of on the back end of the book and, you know, listening to people's reactions about it in 2018, one of the more disappointing things to me is that people are interested 
in this book because it's relevant to what we're looking at in 2018. And that, that also surprised me um, a couple of years ago when I started seeing some of the same kind of language show up in a public way that the Citizens Council is using and Martin vouch for this. I kind of did a basic plan. There was a point in the, in the second revision of the book where the Charleston shooting happened that I had trouble kind of refocusing my attention because of the Rhodesian flag and because of the rhetoric that was circulating in the Council of Conservative Citizens. So the book, you know, has, I, I've had different moments with the book, as I think any author would say. Um, and, you know, as we sort of make our way through some of this material today, you know, that I, I kind of want to just hit some high points about the different stages that the council went through and maybe generate some new thoughts from you on, on how this might help us move forward in our understanding of organized water resistance, how it might help us um, better interpret the moment we're having right now um, as we confront white nationalism, as we look at um, really naked claims to um, white supremacy in a way that I can't remember um, in, my, in my lifetime. So um, the opening slide here is really just to give you a snapshot of sort of these different moments. So you know the the cover of the book, which I love and I had nothing to do with, of course, um, is a white collared shirt, and it's it's sort of what people think about the Citizens Council. This is an organization that is born in Indianola, Mississippi, in the heart of the Mississippi Delta, in July of 1954, a couple of months after the Brown versus Board of Education decision is released. And um, it's actually started by a guy named Robert, known as Tom Patterson, who was um, a famed Mississippi State football player and later a, a plantation owner in the Mississippi Delta. Um, and he is sort of part of this Delta elite, this emerging Delta elite in his case. Um, and he sort of, you know, has this idea that there's no way that desegregation can happen in a place like Indianola, where black people outnumber white people seven to one. There's no way that we would ever swallow that pill. And so he tries to sort of figure out ways that he can leverage local power to quell the civil rights movement and to figure out alternative plans that can get around the Brown versus Board of Education decision. Um, and so what he does is he goes to the white collar guys in his community. And um, you know, the mayor shows up at that initial meeting, and the sheriff shows up, and there are bankers and attorneys who are there as well, elected officials. And the Citizens Council, when it's first born, is looking to operate the way that the Delta had always operated, which is in face-to-face -face interaction. <coughs> you know your community, and if you have a problem with someone, you go directly to them and you fix it. And so the organization is actually born into secrecy. There's this brief period of time um, where the council is looking to just operate on a local level with chapters scattered throughout the state, but with no real infrastructure. Um, they're looking in those first few months, I think, to just kind of pull together the levers of power and to, you know, do sort of a citizen's watch group, see if there are any agitators in their midst. So, in the Indianola model is one that lasts until about December of 1954. Um, but the other chapters that will fill the rest of Mississippi are going to be mostly led by white collar guys. The thing about the Citizens Council, though, is that it has white collar leadership, but they are able to leverage gra grassroots activism by regular folks because of the rhetoric they're using and because of those fear tactics that are so familiar to white Southerners at moments of what they consider to be racial crisis. So the white collar guys are always there and they're very visible, but I don't want that to take away from the fact that the council could not have done its work had it not had folks like Byron Dale Beckwith um, on the ground watching people, intimidating people, and ultimately pulling the trigger. So the council works in a variety of ways. Their literature certainly claims that they are keeping the peace, that they are the alternative to the Klan. But there is no Klan in Mississippi to, 
speak of when they're born. The Klan doesn't really reappear in a visible way until 1963. So the council kind of steps into a vacuum in that way. They have these white collar guys up front, the Jackson model, the Jackson Citizens, Citizens Council, and the Council, um, the Citizens Council of America, which is the corporate structure that um, you find most, I mean, that's what the book is mostly about, is the corporate structure. Those certainly are these white collar guys. But the work that's being done on the ground is being done by regular folks, small farmers, mechanics, wage workers, that sort of thing. Um, so they have, I mean, that cover can even be misleading in some ways. Um, but their logo, which is in the top, this is they keep this logo well through the 1980s. The crossed American flag with the Confederate battle flag. Um, and you can't see around it, but it says states' rights, racial integrity um, around it. They also don't edit that over the years. They maintain that, and, and that really is their calling card. They never pretend like white supremacy is not their intent. So that really indicts a lot of the people who ally with them because they know exactly what they stand for. They're pretty explicit about it. Um, later on, as the Citizens Council moves out of the Civil Rights Movement, they're going to become much more deeply involved in national and international issues. They're always very curious about those things, and they're always planting seeds. But around 63, and 64 in particular, the council is moving into places like George Wallace's 1964 campaign, and then especially in 1968 in his campaign. That Wallace campaign leads the Citizens Council to California, where a number of chapters are founded in 64, 65, and 66. <coughs> they come, they're really seeing, I think, um, a, a vibrant upswing after the Watts riots. Um, and so they're able to leverage some of that white anger in Southern California. There are chapters um, even as far north as Sacramento and San Francisco. So they do have a following there. That directly helps George Wallace get his name on the primary ballot in California. So the Citizens Council is doing a lot of work there. Um, they also have a standing alliance for, you know, as early as 1960 with government officials in South Africa and in Rhodesia, what well, was known as Rhodesia and now Zimbabwe. They are sharing information, media sources, um, they're feeding each other news stories that will be printed in the other's publications. They're also participating <coughs> in bringing each other to um, overseas so that they can make speeches and recruit folks and that sort of thing. Um, and then in 1967, they built a brand new building in downtown Jackson. And so, you know, if you understand how much this costs and the fact that membership is way down in 1967 in Mississippi, the money has to be coming from somewhere else. And that's a tricky trail to follow. The historians in the room have, who have followed financial trails the, a lot of the archives that have been left have been sanitized by members of the Citizens Council. So the collection that's in um, Jackson at MDAH was donated by William Simmons, who was kind of the Citizens Council guy. And he very carefully curates it before he donates it. So there's some really damning information in there that maybe he didn't think was damning. But um, otherwise, it seems to me that it's kind of hit or miss. That way. So I kind of had to, I had to make my way through through some other places to pick up on some things. The Eastland Papers at um, University of Mississippi uh, also great collections, um, and at Stanford University that I recently discovered, and the University of Kansas, um, where the Citizens Council is everywhere. So the book is finished, and I'm not going to add anything else to it. Um, but they keep showing up, um, even though I'm trying to, I'm trying to put them away. So in 1967. They have a new building downtown, state of the art. They have, um, you know, the Clarion Ledger, the paper out of Jackson, has an entire section dedicated to the ceremony um, and cutting the ribbon and, you know, that sort of thing. And I never really knew where the money was coming from. And I was doing a project, I was working on a project on George Wallace last summer, and I was at the Alabama Department of Archives and History. And I was going through the files on the 68 election, 
And this is not in the books. So this is like top secret Mississippi State information. <laughs> um, the book was done at that point. There was nothing I could do about it. Um, but I was just looking through this, and I saw a bank statement of a draft of a check that the Wallace campaign wrote the Citizens Council in exchange for their mailing list. And the check was for $250,000. And sitting right behind the financial evidence was the special section of the Clarion Ledger um, that had all of the ceremony documented. And so it's one of those moments where, you know, I mean, there's not an exact smoking gun, but it was enough for me to sort of snap my fingers and think, you're a rude guy, and the book's done, so there's not much I can do about it. But um, this is what their value was to this emerging conservative slash radical right movement. They had gathered all of these people together. They had gotten them active and really, to be quite frank, angry. The Citizens Council had a lot of constituents who were angry and unsatisfied by 1964, 1965, and 1966. Where were, they, where were they going together? So they ended up fleeing some of them into George Wallace's campaign. Some of them began to work on the ground in places like Mississippi um, to kind of reactivate the Republican Party. Um, some of them tried to transform the Democratic Party. There were various iterations of this that me and my colleagues have looked into, um, and they know more comprehensively than I do. But um, the council had drummed up this response, and then the civil, the fight against the civil rights movement was essentially lost in some respect, at least in the way the Citizens Council was looking to do it, to defeat it, because legislation was passed. But because they had, from the very beginning, looked forward, and they had sort of thought about this as a bigger picture initiative. When the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was effectively passed, they, they had all sorts of places that they could comfortably go. They could build relationships with folks. So they were able to insert themselves in something like the Wallace campaign. They were able to insert themselves in California politics as they tried to deal with what they thought was their racial innocence in the aftermath of Watts. So they're able to kind of pick up on some of this. And not a lot of it, from what I can tell, intersects with what we had traditionally referred to as the Southern Strategy in 1968. They're doing it long before that. They have no interest in Nixon at all. Um, they despise him. Um, and so the first presidential candidate that the council officially endorses is, any guesses? You can't answer because you know. <laughs> Ronald Reagan. Uh -huh. They feel as if Ronald Reagan gets it. He's the first presidential candidate that they feel like is speaking their language. And if you know if any of you are familiar with his campaign kickoff, it happened at the Neshoba County Fair, which Mississippi and Snow West. Um, and so the Citizens Council embraces the Reagan administration. They have not embraced Nixon. And so I think that sort of gives us a little bit of pause, you know, in terms of thinking through the different versions of conservatism that we need to be concerned with. And to confront this issue of, is there a dramatic difference? This is what I'm thinking about right now for my second project um, as I collect things for this. And we were talking about this at lunch. I'm wrestling with this idea right now about whether or not a bright line exists between conservatism and the radical right movement. Um, I think that we have in the past sort of separated those groups. And as I move out of the Citizens Council into a California project, I'm seeing those lines dissolve. And so that's kind of what I'm thinking about right now that came out of this project because I was seeing the council be comfortable in these areas that I didn't think they should have been comfortable in and that they were able to, to stay around in some version until 1989, somebody is paying for that. Um, and so I leave it to future scholars to spend more time on the, on the you know, 70s and 80s. I have one chapter on that. Um, but there's still a lot of work to do on, on that post-1964 period. Um, so just to give you a little sense of the early timeline and you know, sort of the different organizations that the council is affiliated with. Um, you know, Red Board, Board of Education is in May of 1954, the first council chapter, or two, two months later, in Indiana one. In October 
1954, the, the state association forms. And the state association forms because there is a school, a school closure amendment that is being voted on in December. And the Mississippi State Legislature and people across the state are highly concerned about whether and if the Brown decision is going to be implemented. So there's this period of time in, in Mississippi, it runs from 64 to 69, I mean, sorry, 54 to 1969, where very little is done towards desegregation. So many white folks who have fears could reasonably believe maybe this isn't ever going to happen. The council steps into that space where there is a seeming vacuum. And they basically step into the unknown and say, if you support us, we will make sure it doesn't happen. And they're right, it doesn't happen until 1969, partially because of the council's influence, but because of a lot of other things as well. But the perception that the council's presence was critical to staving off desegregation kept them in business, even though a lot of people didn't agree with their tactics. So if you talk to people who remember the council, a lot of feedback that I get when I do book talks, um, people will either do this in the Q&A period or they will um, come up to me afterwards and they will say, my daddy was in the Citizens Council, which recommendation. And I will nod my head and they will usually follow that up with an explanation of, you know, he really didn't want to be in the council. He felt like he had to because he owned his own business or because he was an attorney and he was going to lose clients or um, he was on city council or whatever the case may be. I have no doubt that that happened. Some of that may be fuzzy memory. I don't know. Um, but the council did threaten white moderates with social and, and economic ostracism if they didn't join their ranks. And so the Association of Citizens Councils of Mississippi was a little bit of an umbrella organization that kind of um, coordinated the chapters. Um, but its first campaign was the campaign for school closure. And when they ran that campaign successfully, there was, the amendment was actually passed um, to close the public schools if the federal mandate was going to be enforced. Um, so that was essentially what they were voting on. That amendment passed. The, the amendment stated that when, if, however this happens, we will close our public schools before we will desegregate. And of course, districts in Virginia did this very thing. Um, Mississippi never got to that point. But they had the amendment in place. The Citizens Council came out of the shadows with that campaign. So they were born into secrecy. And then with that amendment, they stepped into a different space, a more public space. And, and when they did that, we begin to see their calls for white unity emerge. So if you know anything about Mississippi history, and I know most of you do, um, Mississippi has this long history of class divisions, um, the Delta versus the Hills region. Um, and because the council was itself born in the Delta, they had to sort of overcome that reputation with white people in the rest of the state to not look like a Delta organization. So one of the ways that they did that was they calibrated their language in their first brochure to appeal to poor whites. So we, what we see here is something that historians know very well, right? It is the use of race baiting to scare poor whites, working class whites, into voting a certain way. In this case, that well-worn tactic is being driven by elites in the Citizens Council and resulted in passage of the school closure amendment. That is kind of where I start my argument for white unity in the book, is their success with that campaign led them in a direction that may not be predictable. I thought what I was going to see was a lot of sort of anti-civil rights, anti-black rhetoric in their literature. It's there. It's in the citizens. But in their national campaigns and in their regional campaigns and on forum, they rarely even recognize that a civil rights movement is happening. So they avoid that and they instead sort of try to forge these, um, what Grace Elizabeth Hale calls common whiteness. Like this is what it means to be white. If we don't stay together, then everything will fall apart. And I see them picking up on that theme over the course of several decades. They stick with 
that white unity thing. And rather than seeing the Citizens Council change its language or soften its language over time, instead what I found is that the rest of the nation became more willing to hear that. They became more sympathetic to that white unity message, especially as the civil rights movement became more visible in the North, um, as it became, um, it became sort of rooted in economic arguments and um, you know, the disparities that existed in the cities, white people in the North, white people on the West Coast started to find some resonance with this white unity message and the Citizens Council was able to make some headway. So the formation of the Association of Citizens Councils um, or, yeah, of Mississippi really kind of helps them tip off that campaign. Um, and then the corporate organization, the one that I follow the most, because that's where most of the material is, uh, the Citizens Council of America became the national organization that supervised their publicity campaigns. The Citizens Council of America also supported um, the forum um, broadcast they were the ones that were working in California. They were the ones that were working in Southern Africa. And so Bill Simmons, the, you know, he is the best known council administrator located in Jackson, um, across the street from Mills House. Um, and he is sort of the, he is the director of the Citizens Council of America. And so he sort of supervises their campaign that way. Um, in March of 1956, so shortly before the CCA is born, the Mississippi State Sovereignty Commission is formed. And I always just bring this up because I think sometimes there's some confusion about the collaboration between the two groups. They didn't care for each other. Um, they actually didn't collaborate much more than they practically had to. Um, when the Mississippi State Sovereignty Commission is formed, J.P. Coleman is governor. And Coleman, who is from Ackerman, just up the road, um, Coleman is no fan of the Citizens Council, and they are not fans of him. He is um, what Earl Johnston refers to as a practical segregationist. He wants to do everything visibly. He wants to resist through the law. He does not like the clandestine um, element of the Citizens Council and their economic terror tactics. And he's very clear about that. So he is sort of amenable to the idea of a Citizens Council-like organization to be established in state government that would be getting state funding to initially the way that it's founded um, is to be a publicity arm of the state to go out of the south and into the north and talk up segregation and sort of say you know you don't know us but if you got to know us you'd realize we're very nice and um, things aren't that bad and actually black Mississippians are quite happy with the way that things are so the Mississippi State Sovereignty Commission is um, and a lot of correspondence is being put forward as a publicity arm. Of course, it very quickly turns into a surveillance agency, which is how most of us know it. Um, but the council sees it as competition. When Ross Barnett is elected in 1959, he is able to sort of pull those two groups together, and the council is able to elicit funds directly out of the Mississippi State Sovereignty Commission to pay for it for them. So they have a relationship, yes, but it, you have to be very specific about what moment you're looking at. Because sometimes they love each other and sometimes they don't. Um, it has to do with whose back is being scratched. Um, Earl Johnston, who served as the director <coughs> of the Sovereignty Commission, had a pretty visible falling out with, uh, with um, William J. Simmons uh, in a commencement address he made at Cabana High School. Um, where he was essentially equating the Citizens Council to the NAACP. And, um, yes, the response was quick. And you can see it sort of popping up in newspapers. But they really cut each other very deeply um, in a public sphere. And Simmons essentially asks that Johnston, demands that Johnston submit his letter of resignation. And there's a period where they sort of let Johnston hang around, like if you behave yourself, then you, know, you can stay in place, you don't want to make a big deal out of this, because white unity, right? This is a fissure, and, and it threatens to encourage more white moderates to kind of rise, rise to the surface, and then the Citizens Council is out of business. So Johnston and Simmons end up exchanging some letters in the 1980s, which I think, are, I think is pretty telling. 
There are several folks who will say to me, people who knew Bill Simmons, because he was a Jackson guy. He went to Millsaps for a couple of years, graduated from the City College. His family's from Utica. Um, his family owned the Fairview Inn, which is um, one of our favorite watering halls at Millsaps. Um, but Bill Simmons knew a lot of folks that I still know in the Jackson area, and they will come to me and they will say, you know, Bill Simmons was reformed when he died. Um, he let black people into the camp. He had dinner with them. These sorts of things. Um, and his exchanges with Earl Jackson in the 1980s countered that. So Simmons is saying things like, this is exactly what we had feared would happen. People are flying out of, white people are flying out of Jackson into the suburbs. They're going to Clinton, they're going to Rankin County, they're going to Madison County. And it's because of desegregation. He talks about rising crime levels, he talks about the blight of the cities, um, this disintegration of downtown Jackson, and he blames it on desegregation. So I think maybe he was not reformed. I think maybe he shifted in the way he was presenting his opposition in a way that many white Southerners did and many white Americans did. Bill Simmons' obituary that uh, um, appears at his death in the clearing ledger doesn't mention the Citizens Council at all. Um, I suspect that he wrote this himself. Um, his obituary talks about a lifetime spent in educational work. So it is kind of. Um, <laughs> Defined, I guess. Um, so he's sort of an interesting figure in that way. I never had a chance to interview him, um, but there have been several oral histories done with him that are fabulous um, and give you some insight. He was super smart, well educated. Um, you know, we were just, Jessica and I were just listening to one of the digitized um, programs, and I was reminded that his voice is very monotone, you know, like he's not a firebrand. He's just a white collar guy, mustache, you know, sort of nondescript in a lot of ways, a little pop belly. I mean, not, not anybody that you would consider to be that worrisome. But people who, who sat in the legislature spoke um, quite frequently about how terrifying he was. That he would sit in the gallery of, um, the, legislature, of the legislature and he would look down on them as they cast votes. And so those are the kinds of memories that haunt people. When you mention Bill Simmons, some people will flinch because they have a really bad memory of him. Um, born to youth on WLBT in November of 1967, um, and then it moves to Washington, D.C., where it will remain in May of 1958. So those programs are being recorded in congressional studios. Uh, in, some, in some cases, it's under the name of John Bell Williams. In some cases, it's under Jimmy Flint's. Um, privileges. So it depends on, I don't, I mean, there are only a few receipts that I've seen, but basically um, they take the privilege and then the receipt goes to the Citizens Council to pay, but they're getting it at cost. Um, and this just kind of gives you a little, um, just a quick look at the way that this organization works. The local chapters were largely divorced from any of the national things that were going on. It is very difficult to find activities about the local chapters. Um, so, you know, you would have, I imagine that some of these things are in people's attics somewhere. Um, there, you know, there's a lot of stuff in the Jackson Citizens Council, but um, only occasionally did I see like Jefferson County or Macomb or, well, it's Pike County, the Pike County Citizens Council. Um, so the book doesn't have a lot of info on the local chapters. Now, the information that we have on the local chapters often comes from memories and oral histories from black activists and from, from white neighbors in you know, certain communities who will talk to you about what they did. But so that, if, you know, in that capacity, that you would have to lean more heavily on oral histories, I think, to capture the local picture. And it looks very different um, space to space. The association um, is, my, is only really visible, it's really only visible to me for about four years, and then um, the, the Citizens Council of America is, of course, where I'm doing most of my work. Um, so, you know, as I, as I finish up, I think probably one of the, the more intriguing things to people about this particular
particular book is, um, Jessica and I were talking about this a few minutes ago, nothing has been written on the Citizens Council, no book has been written on the Council since 1971. In 1994, McMillan's book had its second revision, and he, he changed a little, he added something um, in the introduction, but essentially the book was the same. Um, and he really only covers until 1964. The thing that makes this book a little bit different, I think, is you know the fact that I carried it through to 1989, which led me to reinterpret 1954 forward because I wanted to know like you know how long would it be. Um, but as we see them moving out of the civil rights movement and we see them losing grassroots support at home, their investments in California and in Southern Africa are the ones that I think are most troubling because. They're able to um, achieve quite a bit of purchase in those areas. And the money that's flowing in from funding organizations that are looking to promote things like scientific racism, for example, um, is coming straight to the Citizens Council. And um, I'll close with this. There is a comment that's made by Robert Patterson, who is the initial founder. And um, I believe it's 1987. He's talking to a reporter who is saying, you know, why are you guys still around? Like, give it up. What is there left to do? And, um, you know, he's asking him questions about there's rumors that you're about to lock up the doors and pull the shades down and that sort of thing. And Patterson responds by saying, you know, if we are moving in that direction, it's only because our work is done. We won. And the way he explains that is, white people have not accepted the civil rights movement. They've run from it. And of course, he's referring to migration, out migration into the suburbs. In Mississippi, the huge investment in private schools and he, it's just this profound quote that we run across every once in a while when we're in the archive. Where you think, of course, but why didn't I think of that? I think Patterson and Simmons and many of their supporters felt like what they did was critical for the moment that we're in right now. I think if they were here, I think they would feel like they were a part of that. Um, and what I see, I think, you know, when we look at all the different reputations that the council holds, and I hope my book introduces some new things to consider about the council, one of the most terrifying things that I think they did was their investment in education. Because their development and encouragement and model that they share for private education encouraged families to look into things like alternative education. An education that would enable me to have my child in a classroom that will ensure they are not challenged in the way that I am raising them. And those segregation academies help sort of buttress white supremacy in a classroom space in the kinds of ways that manipulating education always does, right? That you can actually teach something in a certain way and then we will continue to have arguments about what the Civil War was about. Because people are being taught that, and, and that's serious, right? I mean, that's science, or that's history. It's a fact. And so some of their investment that's happening in the private academies left the deepest, I mean, that really left the deepest footprint in Mississippi. It's also being followed by other people across the nation. And we have a moment here, I think, where we're all sort of wondering, why do you believe this? Is true, and why do I believe this is true? And I think the council had something to do with cultivating that atmosphere, um, where their investment in education gave, gave them a power that was not as visible as what we see in the Delta, where people are being terrorized that their mortgages are going to be called in by the banker who is a member of the Citizens Council. Those things are equally terrifying, but long term, the council left a mark on a number of things that I think maybe we're just now beginning to get a little bit of visibility on. Thank you so much for having me. This is a pleasure. I'm sure it's coming from 
multiple places, but the most visible source that I saw was the Pioneer Fund, which is um, an organization out of New York City that typically, it's still around today, the Pioneer Fund um, supports research or research for scientists and sociologists who are looking into, are looking to prove natural racial difference. So the Pioneer Fund was deeply interested in manipulating the educational space so that they can take what they can take their researchers' findings and they can then feed it into um, schools. And so that's the most visible pipeline that I've seen. How many code council schools were there? And I'm familiar with the Jackson Councils. There ends up being four council schools in Jackson. Not all of the academies, most of the academies in Mississippi were not council schools. But they certainly did share their framework um, or their blueprint for it and the contract they offered their teachers and things like that with people who were interested in setting up similar schools. Well, I may be setting up schools, but I was involved in many years ago. And the worst thing that ever happened to Star was the creation of Star Wars Cat. It divided this town in more ways than that. And we are just beginning to re restore ourselves, which is other schools now too, but that um, we just did damage to this community that will never really be overcome. Thank you. Um, when you said when the sovereignty commission was started, it was really supposed to be a PR arm of the state government in terms of <laughs> um, could it be argued then that when Barnett gives money to the Citizens Council, particularly to Forum, that they are then outsourcing the PR element for the state of Mississippi? And if that's the case, um, why then uh, the argument between Patterson and not Patterson, uh, Johnson and uh, Yeah, that's a good question. The council is not necessarily. I should say the sovereignty commission is not necessarily outsourcing. Part of that, part of their argument is because they're trying to do the same thing at the same time. So the sovereignty commission has a speaker's bureau, and they're sending people out, you know, across the country to do this. But I'm, as that funding shifts towards forum, there's not, yeah, I mean, there's not, it doesn't make sense to do both, but in some ways they're doing are trying to maintain doing the same thing for a while. But because Johnston is sort of directing a state agency, there are things, there are language, there, there's language they're not using. And people are not, people really don't like the Citizens Council. I mean, people who are members don't like the Citizens Council. <laughs> they're sending J.P. Coleman letters, you know, in, in 58 and 59, basically saying, you know, we hate this organization and I'm a member, you know, like they, they feel like they have to be a part of it. And so I think the Sovereignty Commission worries that they will lose support from legislators if they don't distance themselves from the Citizens Council. And the council is worried that the Sovereignty Commission is not as supportive of their initiatives as they should be. It's complicated. <laughs> well, they see this. Citizens Council was a black eye of the movement. Mm. Yes. Did, did you ever run a policy off of stickers or mail lines or membership? <laughs> Is there any of that stuff still available? Membership, yeah, I mean, membership lists per chapter are difficult to come by. What you can use is you can use stationery that has the list of administrators along the left margin, and so that can be somewhere. Um, and Jessica, what do you have? What do what does Mississippi State have here? We have a lot of that kind of material. Um, we have fundraising letters that have <coughs> the various committees. They brought Crofton Putnam for a dinner in Jackson in the '60s on his book of race and reason. And so there are lots of names attached to. Um, Fred Smith and I have gone through the list, and you can recognize some of those big names in Jackson society at the time that hosted that dinner. Um, they, they, the, um, their symbol that Stephanie showed, they, ha they pass that out, and we have some, not as a sticker, but as like a flyer, so that would be in membership material. But we have a fair amount of that kind of material in various collections and special collections. And I'm sure it exists 
as she said, in people's attics and all over. Um, Eagle Forum, are you talking about Phyllis Flatley's uh, program? I have not seen any connection between her forum and the Citizens Council, but wouldn't it be great if we could find something? <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole other project. That's what it was. What was the role of white women in this organization? Um, there, I think, are a couple of scholars that are working on this right now. Um, and Elizabeth Gillespie just published a book called Mothers of Massive Resistance um, that looks at women's role in white resistance. Um, the council has a women's organization under the, under the direction of Sarah McCorkle. And um, she ends up sort of, you know, she moves into some different spaces, but they're very, the women um, are very active in schools. So a lot of what she directs, what Sarah McCorkle directs within the Citizens Council framework, is she will go to um, school libraries and she'll case the shelves and she'll pull stuff off and say, no, not this, not this, not this, and then replace the gaps with, um, you know, text on sites of racism and things like that. Um, so they're doing educational work, and the women also supervise their um, our annual essay contest that they have schools participate in that will have questions, have prompts like, you know, what is the legal argument against um, segregation? Or, you know, like, that just sort of trying to get the students to do research using the sources they provide, of course. So they give them a list of sources, and then they ask them to write an essay on a topic like this. So that's largely where I see a lot of the women's work happening, is in the educational space. Well, so, and I'm sorry, Chloe, but you said that the, the organization has to overcome looking like a Delta organization. Could you expand upon that a little? Sure. So the Delta region is um, predominantly black, and it's run by a small white plantation of wheat, basically. Post-Civil War, you know, that region really comes out of cultivation. Because of that, the Delta has sort of been a pariah among some other groups in the state because they tend not to support educational funding because they don't want to put money in black schools and they're in the minority in the Delta. And so there are other issues that people in the Delta split with the rest of the state on um, because their demographics look different and the fear was with the school closure amendment, the fear was that, you know, they were having this conversation about school equalization at the same time. Well, the Delta wasn't at all interested in school equalization. Their schools were already underfunded, as Mississippi schools have always been, segregated or not. Um, and they understood that school equalization was actually not going to be equal for them because of the way that their numbers shook out. So, with the Citizens Council being birthed out of the Delta region, they had to shed that identity if they were going to pull support from the Hills area, from Central Mississippi, and places like that. What about the Citizens Council in Holmes County as a private table We were talking, yeah, we were talking about that earlier. Um, I didn't use a whole lot of that in the book. Um, but she has some very poignant comments, you know, about their heavy-handed tactics and the intimidation that they used, especially towards her. Um, Who is this? Hazel Brandon Smith, um, Lexington Advertiser. Um, Jeff Howell's book on Hazel Brandon Smith with um, my former office mate here at Mississippi State um, does a really comprehensive job of looking at her relationship with them. Because she is, and Hottie Carter is too, who I use a little bit more in the book than I do her. Um, they are racial moderates. I mean, they're segregationists. They just hate the Citizens Council. Um, and so this is like how they're fighting their battle is how can you silence the moderates? It's not just that they're intimidating black activists. They absolutely are. But they are also silencing white moderates um, who are afraid of being ostracized. And so when they start to lose, when, when the council starts losing influence, around, really it's post Meredith. I mean, so it's, it's post-1962. People start, people who didn't like the council anyway start dropping like drop, flies off the membership list. Um, and white moderates begin to speak more openly about their opposition to the council. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Would you say that Brown versus the Board of Education is the primary catalyst for the beginning of the organization, or was it more, I mean, obviously more factors? I would use primary. the word immediate catalyst. Um, immediate. The first chapter, the first two chapters of the book, really the first chapter of the book, is just about the pre-Brown stuff. So it, it's hard, it sort of sets the stage for practice defiance, that they weren't the first group to do this. You know, they're only a few years removed from the Dixie Crap Revolt. And so there's a lot of discontent among white Southerners towards the federal government, and there's a lot of fear on the part of white Southerners about the, um, the changes that are coming down the pike. And so the first chapter is entitled Born Into Defiance, that, you know, they really had a right environment to step into. But certainly, Brown was the thing they feared the most, which was a very direct federal mandate that said segregation was unconstitutional. And so it was certainly the immediate catalyst that forced organization. So prior to this, people are discontented, but they're not necessarily doing much about it. I mean, the Dixie Crab Revolt is a little flash, but the Citizens Council organization is seeing something that's accessible. You know, especially when it's couched in terms of local action, that you could actually monitor black neighbors and white moderates and, you know, people like that who you think might be turncoats. Any other questions? Dr. Rawls, thank you. knowledge of the topic and we very much appreciate you coming and talking to us today. It's obvious that you and I suspect Mark have been uh, eating, breathing, sleeping, <laughs> dreaming about the Citizens Council for many years and it's obvious that you have done a great deal of research and we thank you so much for being here today. We have a small token of our appreciation we'd like to give to you. It's a small box that uh, might con contain some cheese in it, so <laughs> it's additional cheese for us. Thank you so thank much for being here. Thank you. 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 Thank you.